Don't worry, neutral. You've probably only got five or six more years of watching this kind of game between Pep and Mikel. This is the Arsenal Vision Post Match Podcast. My name is Elliot Smith. You can find me on Twitter, Yankee Gunner. If you loved the 0.4 to 0.5 XG game at the Emirates and you loved the 0.8 to 0.6 XG game at the Etihad, then I've got news for you. You're in for many, many years of joy because this is what you're going to get served up. And let me tell you something. As Arsenal fans, we don't give a shit. We're super happy about it because we're very good. We're in the title race. We're in the Champions League. We got a lot to compete for. And I am very, very excited about our prospects. Here to discuss our prospects with me now is Clive. You can find him on Twitter at Clive PFC. Hello, Clive. Hello, hello. I know you love a tactical battle. You Mm. get that big, sexy brain wrapped around it and break it all down. It's going to be beautiful. But we can't do that yet. I got to stop just for a second. Uh, By the way, we did an instant reaction on Patreon. It got a little fiery. It did. I was a little nervous about that. In fact, I kind of edited it because I was worried about the fieriness of it. But to be fair, people have come back and been very complimentary and said they liked it. So, you know, sometimes diversity of opinion can drive really good debate. And I'm glad we did that. Thanks to everyone who was there for that. And if you want to join over there, Lots of great stuff over there, lots of scouting stuff, things like that. But here is what I need to tell you today. It is officially April. And because it is April, it is officially the launch of our fundraiser for the Arsenal Foundation. This is the most important thing we do every year. It is the thing I am the most proud of. Last year, I had the chance to go to Jordan, to go to the Zattery refugee camp and see a refugee camp of 80,000 people, over half of which are kids, and see Arsenal Football Club emblazoned across the camp working on programs called Coaching for Life with Children, helping them stay out of child marriage, helping them stay out of labor camps, helping them stay out of harm's way, stay in school, get the education and the resiliency they need to thrive and eventually dream of a better, bigger life. And the way Arsenal touches their lives, the way it makes them feel connected to the wider world is stunning. And it, it is the, one of the most moving experiences of my lifetime. This week, you'll hear me speak to Leah Williamson. And congratulations to the Arsenal women on their Conti Cup win, by the way. You'll hear me speak to Leah Williamson about her experience there and how life-changing it was. You'll hear about the work being done. Last year, we raised a staggering number, almost half a million pounds. This year, we're going to set the goal at about 150,000 pounds. And we'll see where that takes us. And I know there is devastation and heartache all over the world. And so it's always easy to be like, well, why not here or why not there? My attitude is you got to pick something and you got to commit to it. And when you tell kids, we're going to keep showing up, we're going to keep being there for you, we're going to keep supporting you. The one thing you can't do with children is make a promise and break it. You cannot do that ever. As a parent, I see it. If I don't live up to my word, that's when my children are most heartbroken. And these children, they are wonderful human beings whose only thing they did wrong is be born in a place that was ripped apart by war. So we're going to help them. We're going to show up for them. We will give. I say we, the podcast. I hope you will give if you can, of course, only if you can. But if you can, I hope you will give. If you give, you will have the chance to win a VIP ticket to see Arsenal Bournemouth, our second to last home game of this season in a VIP box, participate in the breakdown live show, meet the podcasters, right? Food and drink, all that good stuff. So you'll be entered to win that. We'll also be auctioning off some of those spaces. If you want to just say to heck with the raffle idea, I'm just going to, you know, splash some cash on this great fundraiser and and take my ticket. We'll be auctioning off some tickets as well. But the most important thing you're doing is supporting a cause that, that helps child refugees. And I I just don't think we do anything better than that. So, um, the, the link is just giving.com forward slash page forward slash AVP. I have it in the show notes. We'll be talking about it this whole month. I'll be doing the auction in a couple of weeks, so I, I hope you will give, um, and you'll be hearing the story of these children throughout the month. Clyde, before we get on to the game, anything you want to say on that topic? <clears throat> no, uh, every year we get here, it seems to come around real quick, but it's our annual fundraiser, and um, yeah, Elliot, sometimes we, just, we may debate football, but we don't debate this, and um, your words were beautifully said, and um, mm. it's, like a, it's, it's, it's almost like a grounding moment for us. You know, we, we we do okay on the podcast and we talk about things and sometimes we all think we're more important than we are, but we're not. We're just guys that like football, hopefully discuss it in a respectful way and have this platform that we can use to benefit other people. So it really does fit our values and um, it really it really is something that I'm very proud to be involved in. And your efforts to push this forward, mate, um, people don't know, but I know, um, are just wonderful. So well done. Yeah. And, and, you know, the thing that I'm so impressed by is this really is a program that spawned out of the work being done in North London. And as a last point on this, when you go to the edge of the Syrian border to a place that you expect to find desolation and misery, because th- that's your expectation, right? Refugee camp, 80,000 people, barely any electricity or water. 
and you hear kids singing Arsenal songs and you see pictures of Arsenal players, men and women. And this program, by the way, 50% girls, 50% boys. It's, it's a testament to the people at Arsenal to have been able to create this. And, you know, they said to us last year, what this community did is the reason this program can continue. So you know, I feel a personal responsibility to make sure that continues to happen. And I, I'm very, very excited to get a chance to do this. It is, it is a special thing. And for the, the club to get to support us and say, here's a box that you can go give away to people so that they'll be inspired to give. For Mikel Arteta to send us a message urging us on, you'll hear his voice. For Martin Odegaard to do it, you'll hear his voice. It, it tells you this means a lot to everybody. So, okay, only took up five minutes of your time with that. Hope you don't mind. Please go to the Just Giving page, justgiving.com slash page slash AVP and, and give if you can. Uh, we will be doing that as well. And thank you for uh, supporting a really good cause. Um, okay, so Clive, let's let's start at the beginning of the day. This this was such a monumental moment, and it comes in a weird time because it's right after the international break, and so that makes everything a little hazy, a little fuzzy. You know how we were playing going into the break, but you never know how we're going to play coming out of it. We do have certain players who have always come back from international break, maybe not quite themselves. I think of Martin Odegaard, for example, a player who, when he gets going, when he gets ahead of steam, becomes an incredible player. Maybe after the international break, not at his absolute peak. You, you get different kinds of performances after this. So it's a weird time, and the lineup comes out, and I want to talk weirdly not about our lineup, but theirs. <clears throat> Their mm. lineup comes out, and Pep has gone for security and control is what it looks like. There's more defenders. There's more controlling players. He doesn't necessarily have some of the players he might want to call on. Ederson, not there. Uh, Walker, not there, obviously. And I have to admit, there's a part of me that looked at it and said, hmm, is this our chance? Do we hit him on the counter with this group? They have a lot of control in there, right? Kovacic next to Rodri. You know, I, I'm, I wasn't sure what to make of what Pep was trying to go for. And I'm curious what you thought that was going to mean. More control like it turned out to be or an opportunity for us to go at them? Because it was, um, it was a, as often as the case with Pep, an unexpected lineup. Yeah, <clears throat> I, didn't, I didn't think it was that unexpected earlier. And look, I'll tell you oh, the okay. reason why. Maybe I'm looking at Kovacic. Because if you watch the Liverpool City game, Kovacic came on late, and that was when the game stabilised. Yeah, And he saved them. They were going to get done, and he saved them. So basically, I expected him to start. So I knew they are going to... I had this feeling they were going to control the game. From seeing the home game this year, it was controlled in central areas. They had Rico Lewis playing central, and uh, they were a little bit bereft because Rodri didn't play. And so they sort of overloaded central areas, Bernardo central, Kovacic central, Rico Lewis central... And they tried to break out, and they went into wide areas, and they went into wide areas, and they were they'd Walker and Guardiola, and I never, and also, I I never worry about them two progressing forward. Um, I just don't. Like when De Bruyne runs into those areas, then I worry. You know what I mean? So, um, but I don't worry about them two. So, I I didn't say this enough before the game, but to me, it's going to be a central block, stay narrow, and always remember you've got to come back to the position of maximum opportunity to score. So when people do you in wide areas, they got to come back into the middle. And if you make sure your spaces are right there, we're going to be fine. And so, yeah, I wasn't I wasn't surprised by City's lineup, but I was surprised that maybe, you know, I expected maybe 35% possession for us. Do you <laughs> know what I mean? I didn't expect mm. 28, you know, or 26, whatever it was earlier. Um, but hey, look, you know one of my lines. I've got loads of them, as you guys know. <laughs> just, just go take the game. What's on offer, mate? If that's what's on offer, take it. Yeah. I. So it's interesting. I read a Billy Carpenter article leading up to this about how you nullify City and, and the, what stats correlate with them playing better or worse. And, for example, Rodri having a lot of short passes correlates with them being very successful. A lot of progressive passes correlates with them being very successful, um, which I thought was interesting. But I think... There, there's two ways you can get forced back by City. You can get forced back because you simply can't get your foot on the ball and they're dominating. You can get forced back by design, right? If you want to be in a low block and and sort of spring from it when you recover. Uh, Billy Carpenter's article also emphasized that Arsenal in, in the games against City, what we've actually done is started out with low intensity, low press, and ramped it up as the game went on. And I think that's what we did here. I think there were two faces that we showed in this game also. When they had the ball deep, we did try to press them a bit. You know, not herring around at them, but blocking them off, seeing if we could catch them. And we did catch them a few times. We did. We did catch them making a few mistakes playing out from the back. 
um, and had some opportunities there. Once they progressed it past that first wave of, of pressure, what we did is we immediately sort of sunk back into our low block and, and stayed there. And I remember a game a few years ago between Liverpool and City when City had been absolutely battering Liverpool. And in the second half, they got back in the game. And Klopp said something that stuck with me. He said, City can get you pushed back so far and put you under so much pressure that you stop playing your football. You just start going long instead of trying to play out. And, you know, we had to remember to play a little bit of our football. And when we did that, we got back in the game. I'm wondering if you think we were victims of that a little bit where I saw players that I usually consider to be technically secure, good with their passing players like Saliba, Odegaard and Jorginho, Kivior to some extent, going long early or playing a first-time ball that wasn't on. Is that the pressure that City put you under? Is that the pressure of playing so deep when we're a team that has not had to play that way all season? <clears throat> well, we're not playing dog and duck, are we? We're playing uh, the team that's got all the all <laughs> right. the medals in the back pocket, and um, was it five out of six years won the league? And so, yeah, we're playing a decent team that knows how to do stuff at home. Was it fifty-seven games? Elliot, they've scored on home on on the trot. And fifty-seven so, games City had scored at the Etihad three years running. Yeah, three years, right? So they know what they're doing. And so my worry going into the game was, oh my god, I just don't want to be behind after twenty minutes. I just want to be able to let the game play out. I didn't care how it was. I just wanted to be in the room in the third and fourth quarter of this game. And so when when teams push you back, you, you look for your exits, don't you? And I felt we had better exits this year than last year. But, you know, we know that Saka has been in cold storage for two weeks. We didn't realize how cold. You know, we mm. hope Martinelli, the little cut on his foot, obviously was not just little cut on his foot. <laughs> and so he hasn't trained for two weeks. You got Jesus playing left back, but really he's almost like one of the six defenders, you know, on the outside. And so our ability to exit in three, four passes, you know, you know, to get into shape to exit was nullified by their ability to get us in in the central areas. The key with with City is, and I learned this on Community Shield actually, because I had a very high seat. The key is once you win it back to try to keep it and to go at least three, four passes, because the moment you lose it as you're expanding into attack, they will kill you. And I just I just realised how they played. I, I just, it just hit me on that day. And so I think it's very key when we win it to just go slow, 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 even go backwards, even if you have it for five passes in non-eventful areas, but then you go forward maybe long, but you're in shape for the second ball. That's really important. They win a the second ball and you're out of shape. They're going in that hole, mate. They're going straight in. They ain't messing about. And they run in there. They double up and they sprint. And then, mm -hmm. and Kevin De Bruyne does this thing. There's a rugby player called Johnny Sexton, right? He's played for Ireland. And he does this thing where he, he passes the ball and he wraps around. And it seems such an obvious thing. What De Bruyne does, he passes to the guy on the, in possession, a little five-yard pass. Then he runs around him in a wrapping movement to create that one yard. And then he clips it into a danger area. You've got to watch this guy. So you've got to make sure your distances are good. You've got to make sure your half spaces are protected. And we did all this. And this is like, this is preparation, mate. This is coaching preparation. I, I'll be honest with you, Elliot. I did not think we would come, we'd see a game where Saka and Jesus were the fifth and sixth defenders in a back line of six. Yeah. Did we talk yeah. about that? We didn't really, did no. we, mate? No, and I, I wanted to ask you about the shape we had out of possession, our low block shape, because it's one I've never seen before. And I, I really think it leads to an interesting conversation about Jesus, who I've seen come in for some criticism in this game, but I see it a little differently. So we were essentially in like a 5-3-2 out of possession. Sometimes a At six. Least when they're, six. Sometimes a six. So, so <laughs> yeah. here's the thing, right? There was a line of five of which Saka was the fifth on the right and Kivior was the fifth on the left, so to speak. But the line of three was Jorginho, Rice, and Jesus. Jesus often was standing there in a line of three in front of the defense and then had to sprint out to the wing when they went out wide to support Kibior and then get back inside. And I think what we were trying to do, and you tell me, and then the two in front of them obviously were uh, Odegaard and Kai, which is pretty standard for us. I think what we were trying to do is really deny access to the top of the box where City kill you more than any team in the league is they get to that zone 14. They get to the top of the D. They get to the center of the box. And yeah. once they get there, they can find Holland. They can do all kinds of things. City positioned Holland and De Bruyne at the top of the box right there on the edges of the D. And our game plan seemed to be, you can go wherever you want, but you can't go to them. 
do whatever you want to do, but you can't go to them. And Jesus had a very important role in getting in between those spaces that, De Bru you know, between where De Bruyne was and the ball was, right? And, and I thought that was a very interesting way that we deployed him. And I don't think there are a lot of guys with number nine on their back that will say, okay, boss, this is my job. This is what I'll go do. And I thought he did it really, really, really well. So what did you think of that sort of unorthodox, out of possession shape that we had and maybe the, the role that Jesus had in keeping the keeping the um, ball from finding their danger men? Yeah, it's really key to protect that right-sided half space. That's De Bruyne land for the sweeping crosses. you got to stand in there. If you stand in there, then he goes and stands somewhere else. If you stand somewhere else, then we put Declan Rice on him. And Declan Rice kept his eyes on him. And between Jesus and Rice, they they really managed those half spaces there. The way we're using Declan Rice as an eight is not as an attacking eight. It's more of as a defensive eight. But what mm. we're doing is we're, we're plugging into something that he has better than, I think, any other player in the world. And that is, he seems to be able to just spot stuff happening and step in there and take it early. And if he's late, he can catch it up and stop it. You know, he's just a master of just stepping in and he does it without giving fouls away as well, which is wonderful, you know, and getting booked. If he does give a foul away, people let him get away with one because he's English, right? So basically, he's just clean when he goes in. And he can just, he can feel the game that way, you know, and that's it's a unique skill. So I was really interested to see how we, we manage this. And I, I tend to agree with you, Elliot, and this is something I want to sort of get across. I hope it sounds correct, right? So, we walk into games sometimes with a a picture, and then the, and then the game changes. But sometimes when we analyse the players, that picture we have in our mind from a two week international break, the previous games we were really really flying, we expect players to play like that, right? So so we bring up and then the game changes and we have this game. It's almost like we lay a tracing paper over the top of this game, and then we analyse those players in that context. I nearly got Jesus' analysis wrong, in my opinion. I, I was thinking, mate, you've had three chances. What's going on? You, I thought, hold on, what's happening here? And I recognised the job, his primary job on the day was to try to get some chances, but actually, you've got to protect our back line. You know? and, and when you're judging Jesus on that basis, you're, you're, you've got to change. You've got to change what you see. If you want to criticise him for the two or three chances, not getting the end of a cross, feel free. With the context of this team performance, defensive performance, he was outstanding. And I, I suppose when we do our judge our team, we tend to judge them in a situation where we have 56% possession in it. And no doubt you know the numbers better than me. But when you have 26, 28, you've got to judge a team differently because they're not on the ball. They're, they're, they're doing different things. So flick your mind to the game that's here and ask yourself how we performed within that context not in the context of Sheffield United, the way we were firing up at halftime. Because it's a different game, different feeling. Yeah, and, and let's face it, scoring goals is hard. And in these games that are tight, when the big moment comes, the reason it feels so painful when you don't execute is you get so few of them, right? Mm. When you're playing Sheffield United and you have 40 chances to score, you miss 36 of them, or the 34 of them, <laughs> but you make six of them and you end up six nil and no one talks about the 34 you missed. When there's three half chances in a game, and that's all they are, half chances, and you don't convert, people go, oh, donkey, you know, you were terrible. You, it's because it's so on edge. Erling Holland has the ball at the back post with a pullback for a goal or maybe slot finish. From I think it's from a corner. Yeah. And it just goes right over his foot. He, he kicks fresh air, basically, miskicks it. Erling Holland's no donkey. Erling yeah. Holland is one of the best strikers in the world. But because you get like a half chance a game in these games, those moments feel big. And I think Jesus suffered from that. Leo Trossard, how mad were people? He didn't square it to Martinelli. Okay, he should square it to Martinelli. Leo Trossard is the reason we're still in the Champions League, by the way. Oh, I'm glad it's you just, said that. Yeah, you, you just get a half chance and it doesn't come off and it, it feels very painful. And, that, and that's what these close games do. And by the way, look at the flip side of it. Mohamed Salah, one of the great players of the last decade. He makes a half chance that he creates look easy when he smashes it in the back and then after cutting back inside, right, in the in the game against us. And that that's the difference in these games. It, it, you know, and, and so I, I understand the frustration, but I do think step one in this game, plan A, was to, to deny them. I do think we set up to do that, and our players did that heroically. Um, I really believe, Clive, the guy who has 
killed us in all of these contests with all these terrible lopsided scores that we know about going back through history. It's not Erling Holland, it's Kevin De Bruyne. Yep. It's Kevin De Bruyne. He's he's been the chief executioner for us. And I really think the game plan was you, you're just going to deny him. Declan, follow him around or you know get the center backs close to him or Jesus, deny the entry. I think it speaks volumes that of their starters, of their starters, only Nathan Ake, who played 26 minutes, so he doesn't count. Only Erling Holland completed fewer passes in this game than Kevin De Bruyne's 29. That, to me, is why they didn't score and why we came away with the draw. And I really think we did a great job denying Holland and De Bruyne. We said, if Rodri's going to beat us, if if Foden's going to beat us, which he wasn't able to do, he was subbed off. You know, Doku looked a little dangerous when he came on. You know, Bernardo Silva got his way past Kibior a couple times. But we de- determined that Holland and De Bruyne weren't going to beat us. And, and he didn't. I want to read you a quote that Mikel gave that I think is brilliant. I think it's really hard, Clive, when you're a team that's used to having 70% possession yourself and pressing in the opposition half to turn yeah. around and bring a display like this. You have to have multiple faces if you want to win big things. And we showed a totally different face today. And Mikel said something that I think is, you know, is, is really, really smart because it's, it's kind of like, how do you, how do you instruct a team that's used to playing one way to play another way? So on how we had to adapt to having an inferior possession in the game, he said this clarity before the game, are you ready to follow 30 passes? And after following the ball, 30 passes, lose the ball and follow another 30 passes. Yes. Then you can play Manchester City. It is very important. If you are not ready to do that, you cannot play against them. And I think, you know, that's where I am going to praise Gabriel Jesus, but praise all, praise all of these guys. He was picked, in my opinion, because he's a guy that Mikel knows can follow the 30 passes, lose the ball, follow 30 more passes. And, you know, it, it takes a lot of talent and effort and work for players who are used to being in the other part of the pitch to do that. So, I think that there's a lot of credit deserved there. And obviously, then there's the point that when the ball does get into the hurtful area, you have to make the key intervention. And that's where I think we can just for a minute talk about this this Gabriel and Saliba partnership and maybe Ben White too, who I thought was heroic. We have added size and power and speed and talent to the back line. And a lot of times what they're doing is they're playing at the edge of the final third. In this game, they had to play like more traditional defenders and they showed that they had that in their locker too. How impressed were you with their ability to nullify, you know, the most dangerous striker in the league? Yeah. So I look at the back four, the the back four center backs. I look at them as a unit. They Mm. were, you know, I watched it again this morning and I didn't realize how narrow they were, you know, and yes, it's good to have six footers there. They got to be intelligent. They got to be quick. They got to be smart. When someone moves out, someone's got to move in. The points in this game when Sleeve was at the right back and, and Ben White was at centre back, I didn't notice that first time round. But it's no problem, is it? If ben White's centre back mm. on occasions. And this is what we have now. If keep your drops inside to support Gabriel. Well, mate, he just played left centre back for Poland twice in the break. It's not a problem. We bought him potentially as a centre back. He has played in midfield, though we see him in midfield not be successful for us, but he has played in there, which means he hasn't got Wellington boots on. He can do bits and pieces there. But more important, what they have, Elliot, is not just the size. They have the weight, so they're not moved. They've got the physicality in the contact. I think that's very important. If you see someone vulnerable, you will go there and you will push them and you will move them. The fact they're not moved and the fact they're proactive in their contact and physicality, not being moved about, that's so important. Be aggressive. Was it Phil that said something? I've got his going from my head. It wasn't definitely not me, that we gave up. (laughs) more fouls at any other time in this game. So we fouled them, you know. We were prepared to stop them and foul them. Again, that's important. You know, I think we did all the right things. And the only times I, I don't get too mad on here very often, um, but if I get mad, one of the things that, two, there's two things that really get to me. Not recognizing the game that's on offer quickly enough and inefficient use of resources. And in this game, we got an A-plus for both of those things. We used our resources correctly, the whole squad, at the right time. And we knew the game was on offer and we adjusted and adapted to it. 
maybe we suspected we we're going to be out of position more than in possession. And so we used those players accordingly. And they knew they were drilled and knew what to do. That was obvious to me. If we'd have had more ball, we'd have played a different way. And on more of our ball players, like Georgina, for example, we would have seen them differently. You know? But in this game, Georgina was literally just pointing and clicking, saying, stand there, go there, stand there. Didn't have a great on the ball game, but we all know he's our coach at the back end of the team. He's the one that's talking, keep everyone awake, keep everyone alive. Say next one, next one. That's that's part of the game too. You know, that constant commentating on the pitch to make sure that less experienced men are ready for the next duel, next fight. It's coming, it's coming. And Georgina does that at the back end of the pitch, and obviously Odegaard controls the front end of the pitch and the technical side of the game. So I always felt again, use of resources, get him out when he's tiring, bring someone else on to do something else and offer a different picture. I was really impressed with what what it how we learned. That's all I want to see, how we how we learn from previous experiences. And when we did, then we applied it. It wasn't West Ham away. It wasn't Sheffield United away, you know? It wasn't even Brentford at home, which was exhilarating with the late goal, etc. But it it's a lot better than that 4-1 last year at the Etihad when we were questioning ourselves, you know, and wondering that gap is still massive. We're just not there. Now we can all confidently say that gap is closing. Is it closing enough to win some big trophies this year? We'll find out. Yeah, it's it's going to be extremely tight. You mentioned something though, you know, about our the fouls we gave away. I thought we were very smart about when we did that. We understood, you know, you can't let them run at you in space, and we prevented that from happening. Declan Rice did it a couple of times. It gives us a chance to just quickly talk about Anthony Taylor. Oh, we yeah. spent a lot of time in the pod complaining about referees, so I think we should acknowledge he kept his cards in his pocket. Maybe at times when he, he maybe shouldn't have. Um, you know, to be fair, I think we got away with a couple of things that could have been yellows. But by keeping his cards in his pocket, I, th- I think what you see here, right, there were no clear and obvious calls he had to make. He saw two teams that were playing very high-level tactical game and he allowed the game to be the star, even though it wasn't much for a new try, except that, rather than himself. Of course, as an Arsenal fan, I like that he kept his cards in his pocket, but I think it's worth a mention that that he did and that the game did not become about the referee. I'm so, yeah, and it, we got to be balanced. And I hope someone clips this up and sends it to the PGMOL because I thought he was brilliant. I genuinely thought he was brilliant because I'm a big believer in let the players win the game. Right, so when Kai Havertz slides in on the keeper, I thought legitimate slide in. I thought he lifted his legs to make sure he didn't hurt the keeper. Now, if you want to, you can you can yellow card him if you want to, you know, and because oh he's gone in on the keeper, but he realised there was no damage. He realised it was a fair challenge. And he said, and they were come to crowding him up. He said, "No, nah, mate, it's just a foul. Move on." I love that. Let's stop looking City players for an advantage to be given to you. Win it with your boots. Do you know what I mean? And we see more of that. I, one of the other times I got mad in this podcast, do you remember it? When Gabriel got sent off at City away on New Year's Day two years ago and for mm-hmm. a, a push on the halfway line and to Gabriel Jesus and suddenly we're down at 10 men. The whole game has changed. We're now in our box. They get a winning goal in the last second. That's crap. That That is rubbish. That's not football. That's not what people need to see people leaving the pitch for, you know? And um, and so this referee worked it out and he gave us something. He allowed the game to be the beautiful game that it was. <laughs> he allowed it <laughs> no, to be... Yeah, hang it in the loo, baby. <laughs> <laughs> he allowed it to be there. And we need to, we need to recognise this and people need to shout loud about how he managed that game. And if he mm. got one or two yellow cards wrong, well, I'll tell you what, that's nothing compared to... What, was it the Chelsea game this weekend? When the... the 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 Burnley guy went through. Sorry, the Chelsea guy went through him, but against Burnley, have you seen that? And Mudrick fell over. They get a penalty. The guy gets sent off, and then Richard um, Vincent Company gets sent off. Mate, that does not belong at the top level. You know, we didn't have any of that in this game. There's an interesting dynamic in this game too that I, I want to get to. I, it's not all happy clappy. I don't think after a nil nil draw we should make it out like we just won the the Champions League final. So I do want to respect both sides of the debate and the discussion here. And one of the things that I think we have to acknowledge is I think it was a nervy start just in terms of our play on the ball. You mentioned a lack of exits. I do think this is where we miss Martinelli. I think 
against the big teams away where they do have the chance to pin you back a little bit. They have to respect your ability to burst out and turn them around. And Kai Kai is a good player. He doesn't run very fast, but Kai Osaka is fast-ish, but carrying something. He has to be managed. He doesn't have that burst right at the moment, not to mention he's sitting in the fullback position. It's Martinelli who would do that for us. We didn't have him. Neither Jesus nor Trossard is going to do that. You know, Martinelli came on obviously later. So I, I understand that we didn't really have the exits. But having said that, I thought we were uncharacteristically sloppy with the ball and fell into the yeah. trap that I think Klopp described, which is, oh, oh, they're going to press me. I'm just going to kick it long and hope someone gets to it instead of playing around. And in fact, one of our best moments of the game came from this sort of one, two, three, tic-tac-toe passing up the right-hand side. I think it started with Saliba, it wound up at Saka, and that may have led to it's been the slid cross. cross that... Yeah, that, that oh, the sack of no, cross. You're right. Was, yeah, the, the sack of cross that, that Jesus doesn't get to. There was also a Ben White cross that falls to Jesus, and he hits it early with his right. I actually thought he did what he needed to do there, and you know, just just a little bit wide. But um, what what did you think of of some of the poor passing? This is the second big game away that I think Saliba's looked slightly nervy. At least early on, I thought he looked nervy. Um, Porto away, we saw up close and personal that he looked a little below his best, a little nervous his passing was looser than I expect. And, and I thought Kivior, I said this on the instant reaction. I'll tone down what I said there here, which is in a high, high, high level game of extremely elite players at the top of their craft. I think he stood out at least early in the game as the player that was struggling with the level. Silva got past him a few times. His passing was off. And I think that also made it easier for them to compress us deeper because we had no exit up the left. To be fair, we also had no one running away up the left. So what do you think about some of the the looseness with the ball and lack of composure trying to play around their press, more so in the first half? Yeah, it was a frustration for us. And um, I thought, you know, Raya looked a bit edgy on occasions, you know, with his feet. I thought Sleeper a bit edgy. Um, <clears throat> Martin Odegaard, on the ball king. Some of his passes mm. were not, not normal standards for him. A bit heavy and not weighting the angle correctly. Kivior did a Cruyff turn and got out of jail. One time looked really good. Next time, you <laughs> feet of clay, <laughs> getting trapped on mm. the ball. Jesus trying to buy fouls, not getting fouls. They're transitioning on us. I just thought it was it was a bit edgy. And I was a bit worried at that period, if I'm honest with you. Um, but then we settled. Then everyone settled. And I actually tweeted out, just give people time to settle. Like, come, how did you feel leading up to this game? We were edgy and nervous. We were edgy and nervous because I think, well, I think, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking for everybody, the reason why I was edgy and nervous was I, I, I think I'm, I can see this team. But if if I got it wrong and this team is not what we think it is because City then sticking up with four passes, I'd have been devastated, Elliot. I'll tell you now, I would have been devastated because this time last year we were top of the league. You kept telling me, Clive, the underlying numbers don't look so good. Our XG difference doesn't look so good. We've given up too many shots still, blah, blah. I look at everything now, and it's all here. The numbers are here. The players are here. The league position is here. What we're doing is is good. So I'm thinking, okay, I know what I'm looking at, but it's still City away. And if they slapped us, I'd have, I'd have been in a, in a dark place. And so to get mm. on, maybe some people are not celebrating like one of the Champions League. I think they're celebrating the, val the validation that the team is what we think they are knowing they're going to improve. And I think many of us have this warm feeling, that, crikey, we're actually okay. We're quite good. And by the way, our wide men are not fit. Jesus is not fit. Tom Yass is not fit. Party's not fit. This is one big training session. Havertz came back from international duty, looked for the first time a little bit tired. Odegaard, a little bit tired on. Sleeper took a while to warm up. Big Gabby and Ben White, no shock. They were here training. They look pretty good. Do you know what I mean? They look pretty good from minute one. And so I do think it's a shame the game was where it was scheduled. I think it was a shame for both teams. I think it affected the quality of the game, affected the offensive freshness of the game. Mm. But I think we learned some stuff about this team and then some of the players that needed some minutes, they got some and they'll build their fitness towards the end of the season when we're going to really need them. Yeah. To, to, my, to my point about slack passing though, I can't have it both ways because... I, I'm criticizing that we went long, sometimes under pressure, instead of trying to play our football. But actually, the most danger we came under 
was trying to be too cute in our own box instead of getting it out. So it, you know, it's like on the one hand, I'm like, well, just play ticky tack of football all the way up the pitch and score a goal. Why don't you? On the other hand, I'm like, get it out, get yeah. it out. Can't so it. Can't you can't have it both in those ways. Areas. Can't get caught in those areas. Look, You're dead otherwise, mate. You're dead, dead, dead. If they score one and the crowd gets up, you can literally throw away our league season. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, you lose, like you that. lose this. It's done. That that's yeah. the difference. And by the way, in our predictatron, which was very Arsenal centric, as I pointed out, and I'm not saying that's how it's going to go. Surprise, surprise. All the Arsenal supporters on this pod had Arsenal winning the league, but <laughs> we all had us drawing this fixture. Yeah. And had we not drawn this fixture, our predictions would have been Arsenal don't win the league in any of our predictions. So it, it is as simple as this was a must not lose. Clive, before we, uh, look at a few individuals, talk about subs a bit, talk about, you know, if this was a good result and, you know, maybe even we can cover a little bit of the outrage about the fact that this wasn't a fun game for the neutral. One of the things that I, I think stood out to me in the first half in particular is the star of this game, the star, Gabriel was fantastic. Saliba was fantastic, right? They had players doing incredible things. The, the player that stood out to me is Declan Rice. Declan Rice is the player that a couple seasons ago, City would have hoovered him up and everyone would have said they bought the league again. Right? He should be yeah. playing at Manchester City. Right? That Because that's just what you expect. I cannot praise Mikel Arteta enough for building a project this quick, this good, this enticing, that Mikel Arteta was able to go to the best midfielder in the league and say, don't go there, come play for me. And talked him into doing it. And he, he's the reason we got through that first half. The ground he covers, the balls he hoovers up, the way he tackles from strange angles with those telescoping legs, the way he can be physical, the way he can foul without it being a bad foul, the way he can play progressively in the eight and, and, and score goals and progress the ball in some games, but in this game, slide right back into that mindset of shut out the light, block out the light. There's nowhere for you to go. And, this is the thing we had to have. This is the piece we had to have so we could play in these kinds of games. I, I, I just can't be more impressed with him than I am, more impressed with Mikel Arteta for being able to set us out to play so many different ways, but also building a project that entices that player to come to us. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't want to turn this into a hagiography, but like <laughs> I thought Declan Rice was brilliant. And I, I think he's the guy who has leveled the playing field a little bit between these teams. It, it should not be overstated that Arsenal have four points against Liverpool and four points against City. And in a title race, especially a three-way title race, the team that does that puts itself in a position to go on to win the title. We've done exactly what you need to do. Um, and and he's a big reason why. Yeah, <clears throat> came to City home game, he cleared the ball off the line. They'd normally score then. And uh, he was he saw it, cleared off the line. We stayed in the game and then uh, we took him late on. I think for me, and I remember, I remember being on the stage in Union Chapel and I, and I spoke about our off-the-ball play, but also controlling momentums. So if you look at Declan Rice's game statistically, Elliot, I'm sure Scott will, I'm sure you have already. It's okay. You know, a few touches, a few giveaways. But we all know, watching the game, how he tracked people, controlled people, delayed people, doing all those intangible things that maybe not show up on a sofa score score. Do you see what I mean? And making catching somebody and making them turn back out the other way, which stopped us being broken on in disorganized defense, that stuff is invaluable. Stopping people in, and they're trying to create momentum against us, stopping attacks. We have five passes. Your moment is over. We've got the ball now at our goalkeeper's feet. What are you going to do now? And that's discouraging for Man City. You want to create waves of attack and put us in their washing machine and spin us around and make us not be able to find passes and just give them the ball back really, really cheaply. So he's the one that stops momentum. And then when he's on a really, really good day, he can create offensive momentum going forward. That wasn't the day for each day because exits were standing three yards behind him. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And so that was a difference. But that was today. That was, a, that, was, that was on offer today. So for me, those momentum changes, he's the best at it. So when I was on the stage, I was thinking about him basically. And he is exactly what this team needed because the end of last year, in the last 10 games, we didn't have the ability to control momentum and the ball's in our net and then we had to fight back. Big three threes, two, two draws, 
three two wins. That's my flipping heart rate is dying, right? So um that can't happen. You can't have that over a season. There'd be nothing left of you, as well as the fans. Mm. We're all we're all drained, you know. So so he's the guy that's brought the calm in and he epitomizes the direction, technical direction that we've taken. So no one was calling us the best off the ball team in the world last season, were they? Yeah. Right? No. Right? Some of that's coaching, some of that's personnel. And he's part of that. I think we also have to be careful about drawing too many conclusions from this, Clive, in the sense that, oh, this player wasn't good, or Jorginho Jor- wasn't on the ball, you know, or Reed. Kivior, his passing didn't look up stuff. We got to be careful because we won't have another fixture like this this season. The Allianz away, maybe, but like, this is the hardest fixture in world football right now. This is the team that can squeeze the life out of you more than anyone else. N- almost every single other game we have this season, we will, I, I promise you this, with the possible exception of the Allianz, we will have more possession in every game we play the rest of the season, okay? Or at least close to 50-50, and we'll play most of it in the opposition attacking third. So the lesson from this game is if we need to be on the rack and we need to defend, we can, but we won't be doing that most of the game, so I don't want to take too much away from it. I do think if we get a 1-0 at the Emirates against Bayern, how much will this help us? When we go to the Allianz and Mikel says, Remember what you did at the Etihad? If you do that at the Allianz, you're in the semifinal of the Champions League. You know you can do it. You did it against them. You gave away nothing. You shut out the light. Shut out the light for 90 minutes again, and you're in the Champions League semifinal. I I do think showing this face and showing that we can do this effectively, even if it's not the way we prefer to play, gives us, I think, even more encouragement for the Champions League than 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 the Premier League, potentially. Um... And so it'll be interesting. And in fact, and we'll cover a few of the moments, we could have scored in this game. I mean, I, look, I don't want to sit here and be like, we should have won it because you can't have 26% of the ball and and 0.8 XG and say you should win it. But we had the chances and we'll cover them. I want to cover the subs too. So we'll talk about some of the key moments, some of the subs and what we take away from this as, as a good point or not. I do have to tell you about um, this first though. Otherwise I won't literally, literally, won't be doing my job, like literally. <laughs> so uh, I mentioned last time we have a, a new uh, part of the family that is unified, and I'm going to spell it because it's not spelled in a way that you would expect. It's U-N-I-F-Y-D. I'm learning about this along with you, uh, but unified, whether you're a world-class athlete or a podcaster like me, which is, let's be clear, not a world-class athlete, the importance of mental and physical well-being and proper recovery for top-notch performance is critical. Unified Healing is a new and super innovative global network of wellness centers powered by the Energy Enhancement System, or EE system. You can read about it on their website and the PhD doctor who helped uh, uh, create it. If you haven't heard of the EE system yet, uh, the technology promotes wellness, deep relaxation, uh, rejuvenation, whether you're, you know, local to this podcast or all over the world, wherever it is, there are hundreds of locations all over the world. Access is easy and affordable. If you're interested in experiencing the EE system technology for yourself, go to unifiedhealing.com. That's U-N-I-F-Y-D, unifiedhealing.com slash arsenalvision to learn more and find a center near you. That's unified, U-N-I-F-Y-D, healing.com slash arsenalvision. Do it now, Clive. Oh, wait, stop. There's a disclaimer I have to read. I should read that. You know, having been a lawyer myself, don't want lawyers mad at me. No material testimonials on the Unified Healing website are intended to be viewed or medical as medical advice or a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified healthcare provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition or treatment and before undertaking a new healthcare regimen, including the EE system. Clive, is that enough of that? Indeed. <laughs> I was born to read disclaimers. In another life, in another life, a more satisfying life, I'm a professional disclaimer reader. Um... Okay, Clive, can we cover a few moments for a minute here? So so they they had some moments. Their biggest chance, ironically, came from a corner. It's the Ake header that just falls into the lap of, of Ryan. It's kind of a nothing moment, weirdly, but in another world, that just gets scrambled around and falls into the net. Yeah. But we had a lot of what I'd regard as half moments to maybe do better. Let's cover the Jesus ones first. There's the one that falls to him on his right, the the floated cross that he hits with his right near post goes wide. Yeah. There's the one where he shimmies, shimmies again, shimmies again, shimmies again, blasts it far out by the, by the far post, the one he has blocked. Look, it was, and, and then of course there's the sack across. He doesn't get to, I, I do think people are a little bit harsh in the 51st minute for a guy who 
hasn't played a ton of football this season, who has just defended for his life for 50 minutes and has been sitting super deep and is now trying to sprint up the pitch, not getting there. But to be fair, I was pretty upset with that too. I want him to get there. What do you think of the the catalog of chances that Jesus had? And the, I think the general sentiment of people being frustrated with what he did with them. The first plus point, he's look, he looks fitter, doesn't he? For the two weeks, mm. back at base, mm. he looks fitter. So we may have another centre forward option again, which we're going to need, right? So the fact he's getting chances is is step one on his road to recovery because he hasn't been a player for us this kind of year really in any big, sizable moment. So that's step one. So first chance ball comes over Akanji's head. So Akanji's jumped under it, mistake. But what he's done really well, he's turned around very quickly, blocked out the light. So Jesus has a decision to make. He takes an early volley. Um, of course, when he takes the early volley, we all say, oh, maybe you could have chopped back on him. <laughs> That's good or woulda, shoulda, sort of analysis. Then you have the, the when he beat three or four men going across the box, the right foot shot, could he have shot a little bit earlier? Um, not sure about that. Then he does another one when he chops it to his left foot. So Ben White goes out on the right, tips to the back post, Kivior comes out of the ground. What's he doing there, son? Like a hedgehog, just pops out of the ground, lays it back to him. And... Um, because he was calling for it early in the Odegaard zone. I'm thinking, mate, can you not get in the box? Leave that to Odegaard, because I, I fancy his shot, the edge of the area. And um, but then he takes it and goes to his left foot and screws it past the post. I quite like that chance as a, as a opportunity made. I thought it was a really good bit of football. But then you have the one at the back post, and that's the one I feel the most regrets about. And I did a little bit on the right last night, and I thought, I, I didn't think I did it right, to be honest. I, I didn't realise the run was correct. <laughs> I thought, he's running into the box. Akanji's coming. And he's got his eyes on the ball. And Jesus got his eyes on the ball. And Akanji's got his eyes on the ball. And what Akanji does, Jesus has got the front position. And he, Jesus lets him run across him and boss that position. He then has to adjust yeah. to the yeah. outside mm-hmm. of him. While he's adjusting... He loses the half yard that he needs for the tapping. Now, I'm no striker, right? And people that know me, they're laughing right now because they know that's true. <laughs> I'm no striker. Yeah. But I'm thinking, mate, box him out. Box him out. If you run in front of him and he takes you out, you're getting a penalty. The ball's running across the area. Box him out. Don't let him in front of you. Don't defer to the back post. Saka's cross was beautiful. It was slow. It gave him time to adjust. It was perfection. I just wanted him to hold that front position Make a Kanji goes a long way around. Make him dive in and maybe give something away. Hey, look, like I can say I'm no expert here. But that's that was my feeling watching it. And um, but it is what it is, right? Um, when Trossard went through Elliot, he only went through late. First touch, shocker, shocker. First touch, close the pitch up rather than open it up for him. If he'd have gone slightly ahead of him, get out of his feet, he'd have crossed it to Martin Elliot, and that would be now. I think he might have an offside. To be honest. On on the second one when he when sorry on that one when he goes to take his shot eventually, we know Trossard is a dummy merchant, don't we? He puts you, he twists your legs, he twists your socks, but he took the early shot and he's gone high. Again, a bit of nerves, a bit of big moment yeah. stuff. It, mate, he always chops, didn't he? He always chops back. We think he's gonna shoot. He chops back. If he chops back there, mate, flipping out that that defender doing the impression of Dallow or Man United he's sliding <laughs> through right and he's in another stratosphere then he's slotting it in and he's an absolute hero in front of the Arsenal fans these are the little moments that we all remember when we don't have the ball and he's just ashamed didn't execute on the day yeah for me the the biggest moment the Saka one that Jesus doesn't get to feels like the biggest moment but it, it looks like that because the ball goes rolling through but nobody gets there yeah yeah the 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 Trissard one felt like the one because I, I do think uh, under normal circumstances, he either shows a little more composure to your point. And like, I, yeah, I think brilliant. finds the finish or first time across to Martinelli. And then look, Martinelli still has work to run onto it and finish. I'm not saying he definitely does, but it becomes a very, very, very big chance um, alone unmarked. I think this is the thing that I, I really believe people get wrong about close games there are so few chances and almost no clear chances. So the half chances get imbued with more importance and the players who don't finish the half chances come in for more criticism. I guarantee you in our 6-0 against Sheffield United, 
we missed more half chances than we did in this game. I guarantee you in all those games, we're racking up five nils and four nils and six nils. I guarantee you we had chances. We didn't put away many more of them than in this game. And players didn't come in for criticism because why are you going to criticize when you've scored four or five or six? It's in these really tight games where you know you're going to get one half chance and you have to take it. And to be fair, again, in the Porto game, we created almost nothing. But we took the one chance we got. And that's that's the difference between all your hopes and dreams coming true and not coming true. Because when we play Bayern, for example, we're not going to have 7.2 XG. You know, it's going to be another 0.8 XG home, 0.6 XG away. And you hope you score two goals on that XG instead of zero. You know what I mean? And, and yeah. the problem is, the player who doesn't finish the chance that can make your dreams come true comes in for criticism, and I totally, totally understand that. Saka wasn't fit enough to play the full 90. Mikel uh, comments on that. He said, uh, well, as you know, he's been out a few weeks now with a little problem, and he was feeling that fatigue. Right now, he hasn't trained. He trained one day before the match. He had a big contribution, but 90 minutes were too much for him today. The good news there, Clive, if I read the tea leaves there, and I hope you feel the same way, is that it indicates that he's fine. Fine in the sense that he'll need to be managed a bit, but not, you know, not, not injured. injured. He wasn't, injured. you know, not injured. Exactly. Um, let's talk about some of the subs, though. Why they came on, when they came on, what we did. Um, they had to obviously, by the way, replace Ake for Lewis on 26 minutes. I, I confess, you know, they weren't at their absolute fullest strength, but, you know, I don't think that changed a whole lot about the game. It's strange um, when Lewis came on, he was able to do the old inverted thing. Because we were so far back at that point, they didn't need the fourth defender. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and they could go and in the back him. three yeah. and one in Rodri in front, and he could just travel around the midfield. So, again, if we had our speed, Elliot, you know that wouldn't have been the case. We'd have, we'd have took him, wouldn't we? So there you go. It's really interesting though, seeing how our our bench has evolved, and now you can bring all kinds of players on who are basically players we regarded as indispensable first team players. You know, Thomas Party can't win if Party's not available, right? Can't, now these these are these are indispensable players coming on. We brought Tomiyasu on. We brought Party on. We brought Trissard on. We brought Martinelli on. Um, I, I want to take these one time. So just quickly on Tomiyasu, I thought he looked nervous and and he got off to a rough start. I think yeah. um, settled down a bit. But Tomiyasu has played so little. What do you think of guys coming on in spots like that? who have just played so little football. I, I can't imagine how difficult it must be to get up to the intensity of that game when you've had almost no intense game time under your belt in months, you know? Yeah, I mean, it just shows how far we've come. I just checked the, the game. We know the game we lost 5 nil a few years ago. We got a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. um, back five of Tierney, Klasnik, Holding, Chambers, Cedric Suarez. Right, so how that did that team all... not keep a clean sheet at the Etihad? What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> and we're bringing on Tommy Asu to close out the last twenty minutes, who hasn't played much, but we know he's on a much better level than any of those five players I just mentioned. And that's you, how I see. You it. felt that was a direct response to to uh, Doku coming on, right? I mean, absolutely. And this is a this is the thing, Elia. And this, these two sets of coaching staff, they know each other so well. They know their moves. They look at the benches and they say, okay, if they do this, we're going to do this. And they were ready for it. They were ready for it. As soon as it happened, he was warmed up, ready to come on. You know, and um, and so it, it's very, very smart. In fact, actually, I was watching that 5-0 game. I've been a bit of a geek over this sort of Easter holidays. Watching that 5-0 game, watching the, the Liverpool game when um, when Sammy gave the ball away. And, I'm, and I was watching the respect by which Klopp and Guardiola sort of – you know, Mikel had to go and shake their hands, walking away from humble defeats. And then I watch him coming out of Anfield 2-2 this year, and I watch him with the coaching staff at City this year. The respect level has gone up. And I feel happy for him that he's not walking away humble, saying the gap is huge, blah, 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 trying to convince everybody to stay with the project, etc., etc. I feel really pleased for him that he has put this team together that can manage all the game scenarios that other teams are going to throw at us. We might not win every game, but we are prepared. We can go deep, we can go high, we can do what we like. And we've got the speed in most cases, the physicality, the technical ability, and the coaching on pitch and off pitch to allow us to manage the adaptions that you need to take in the modern game. 
And they, when City changed shape, we adapted. When they brought Souls on, we adapted. It's what it's what I've always wanted, mate. It's what I've always wanted: the ability to see things, have the players that can adapt to it. It's, it's really is a. It's not a day for open top bus. It's not, it, but it is a day to recognise we have a serious, serious, young, experienced, maturing team. It really is. If that mm. hasn't got through yet, I'm going to try and get it through. We just need to keep this going and execute. On Thomas Party, it's such an interesting one for me. A, a player that was the key to us being able to win games for a while there and, and what wrecked seasons was just not being able to rely on him. Now we have Declan Rice. And we have Jorginho, who has been critical to us being in the position we're in this season. This wasn't a great Jorginho game. And so I think there is this curiosity. Will Thomas Party be able to stay fit for the run-in and get to a level where he looks like Thomas Party? And suddenly, Arsenal with Thomas Party, a fit on form Thomas Party and Declan Rice. That's that's something. But you look at him out there, and this was a very mixed cameo in a way because for the first 10 or 15 minutes, there was a part of me that's like, wow, he might be done. He was struggling with the pace of the game, struggling to move around a little bit. He had that one recovery run where he just got like lapped by the field. He looked like he was running through treacle. But then he starts to get his foot on the ball. He starts to get to the tempo of the game, and he winds up having more passes, more carries, more progressive distance, more final third entries, whatever, than Jorginho did in his 20 minutes on the pitch, 25 minutes on the pitch. Uh, You know, so I'm torn on this one because I really thought for the first 15 minutes watching him, he just might not have it anymore. He didn't look comfortable physically, but then he sort of loosened up and 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 we saw a bit more what we expect Thomas Party to look like. So how do you balance those two parts of his his cameo? Because the thing that will stand out in a lot of people's minds, Clive, is just him getting run past. Um, you know, because the criticism with Jorginho is we're like, well, Thomas Party has a little more agility and mobility, but it didn't look like it in that moment, you know? Yeah. It's a it's a conversation I want to hold for a little bit longer because um mm. to be able to play, you need to be fit. It's quite interesting that when he gets the ball, people stand away from him. You know why? Because they know he's good. They know he mm. can shape the ball. Odegaard knows when to move to get it. You know, on the Trussard chance, if you watch it, Party gets the ball, controls it. I don't, you know, I'll be honest with you, I know him quite well from a footballing point of view. I thought Man City should have pressed him because I don't think he quite had it under control. But he may simply play the ball away from the press. Odegaard sees it and thinks, you know what, if I go in behind their line here, I'm going to get the ball. And he does, and he plays it through the lines, line splitting pass, next pass through to Trossard, and we're off we're off and running, having regrets. And that's what he can do. That's what he can do. And I'm afraid other players, including Declan Rice, may turn out and go out the other side. And people have their strengths. And that and that's absolutely fine. A, a 26-year-old fit Thomas Party, we would not be looking to go into the market in midfield this year. But I'm afraid no, of he's, course not. He's, he's a little bit older now. And he, I think he must have had maybe, I don't know how many Premier League starts he's had this season, if any. Right, so one or two, Forrest, the right backy one. Um, that's it. I don't think him and Rice have played together apart from the community. Three starts, shows. three starts, three right? Starts, so yeah. three hundred, so, three hundred minutes, three hundred minutes, and he comes on Man City last three minutes, and people are saying what they're going to say. I'm just going to hold my thoughts for it. He needs to be fit. Much like Tommy Asu, who hasn't played since the Asian Cup, he needs to get fit. If Tommy Asu is fit, he starts his game. Simple as that. You know, it's as simple okay. as that. If Jesus is super fit. Maybe he starts his game as centre forward. You know, it, we just have to wait. We have to wait. Well, okay, I want to ask you about that. I think one of the most fascinating discussions that's going to be coming up, because we have so many important games coming up, is the left-back position. I think this is an interesting one because Zinchenko is probably going to be fit very soon to the extent that he's ever fit or fit for long. Tomiyasu is back fit. Kivior has been a hero of our season, but I think there is at least a reasonable appreciation that in a team full of absolutely elite top of the top of the line players, he may be more squad player level than starter level in a team that wants to do the things we're going to do. So I think that's the one that might keep Mikel up at night a little bit is who he's going to pick. Maybe he, he, he rotates them because in Tamiyasu, you have a guy who doesn't stay fit. In Zinchenko, you have a guy who doesn't stay fit. So Kivior starts against Luton and Kivior starts against Bournemouth and Zinchenko can start the home game at the against Bayern, but Tamiyasu can start the game at the Alliance. It's going to be really interesting. Do you have a thought of how, and by the way, 
I'm not counting Timber in there. My opinion hasn't changed since he did his ACL, which is let's let Timber have the time he needs so next season he is fully fit. I agree. Rushing guys back from ACL injuries is a huge mistake. And given that we now have three fit left backs, playing a guy off an ACL injury at the critical part of the run and just doesn't feel wise to me. So that's my opinion, not saying it's right. So let's not count him in this conversation. Agreed, Elliot. Of those three guys that we do have, though, how do you see Mikel figuring out how to deploy them? Yeah, so put Ben White in there, and, and then you've got four fullbacks. And mm, if we're playing yeah, every yeah. three days, it's quite an intensive position. And that, for me, is the horse course position. Right, so if we're up in games, I mean big up in games, then Tommy Asu can drop into one of the centre back positions and give someone some minutes off towards the end of game. Um, ben White, he's got he's got a strapping to die for there on his right knee. So let's just mm. pretend that Tommy Asu is not going to share minutes with him at right back, right? And so we need Zinchenko fit for the day when, when we need something else at left back, you know, and we and we need to be able to rotate that as well. We all know Zinchenko can't play twice a week, otherwise the old calf goes. And so we just need to know we've got full fullbacks for two positions and we're going to have to rotate them in. And and to be honest with you, they're all pretty good, in my opinion. They're all pretty good. They're all at a level that we'd respect. I think Zinchenko brings something unique that no other fullback apart from Trent provides in the league. And so there will be a day, particularly at home, when we're going to want him on that pitch when we're dominating teams and he, he creates those overloads in central spaces that we're all aware of now. That we weren't aware of two years ago. So, yeah, we just got to wait and see how this plays out. Luton might be a day for Zinchenko. I don't. I hear a lot of Luton disrespect, by the way. But you know, in my head, I'm thinking, okay, maybe we start the game with with Kivior, but bring Zinchenko on a little bit earlier to build up his minutes, build up his fitness when we really need him. Or do we start with Zinchenko, control the ball, control the chances, get the goals, and then end the game with Kivior, just lock the door up, you know, and um, and see what happens. We got these options now, so I'd rather see how we go. But respect your position. Let's not pretend. Remember Southampton three three. We all rocked up to that stage and thinking top league, bottom league. One minute we're one nil down, chasing the game, three three draw. Our dreams are gone. So respect the game. Respect the opposition. Yeah, I think one of the things that stands out to me about us now, by the way, Clive, is the mentality. We play with an intensity and emotion but the right side of the line. Mm. Um, you you compare Gabriel getting sent off a couple seasons ago, as you referenced, his first card was for dissent, right? And and just the way we would struggle, Granite Shaka for years, and obviously we, we love the way he ended his career at Arsenal, but let's not pretend that he didn't have the red mist, that he didn't play on the wrong side of the line. Yep. I can remember a game at Anfield where he got mixed up in an altercation that led to you know Anfield waking up and, and Liverpool coming back into a game a bit. And I know, but you know, he, that may not be what, why that came went yeah. that way. But my point is, I think we play on the right side of the line now. And I think a really, really interesting just um, moment is what happened at the end of the game. After 90 minutes of battling, who was the player who lost his rag? Who was the player who couldn't handle it? Erling Holland. Erling Holland got ground to dust by these center backs who've done it to him twice this season. And he was he was looking for Gabriel at the end of the game. And Gabriel got in his face in the game. He wasn't cowed by him. He wasn't intimidated. He was battling with him physically. But he wasn't crossing the line. He's found the line. And I think Saliba helps with that too because he just has a coolness about him that he can play with intensity without being em too emotive. And it was Holland that left that game losing his rag a bit and Pep had to get between them. And then look, let's, they hugged it out. They said, good game. I get it. But what do you think of that? I thought that was such a fascinating moment seeing Holland really wound up. And then you got Roy Keane saying Holland played like a league two player, which I'm here for. <laughs> so, but I, I think the way we play on the right side of the emotional line now and, and Holland walking off the pitch as the player who was riled up like that, that, that makes a nice change from what we've seen about Arsenal over the past few years. Yeah, we'd all worry about the red cars, wouldn't we? How many times we see, we see games with ten men, and we were thinking, "Crikey, this was this was happening not that long ago." You know, um, it's not just defenders, but forward players. You know, we've got Michael Oliver setting off Martin Elliott for nothing. Remember that one, the double yellow. Um, so there's been a, there's been a few things that have happened that have really dictated the story of the game. There's been our own actions, our own indiscipline. I didn't like it at the time. At the time we were podcasting about it, I would be saying to you, yeah, but they're wrong. He's wrong. We have to recognize the trend. And the trend is we had in 
an indiscipline and maybe an emotive style that manifested itself in referees stepping in and controlling our destiny. So now we've got a situation where we've got a bit more respect, a bit more maturity and physicality, and basically we are now on an even kill with these teams, and the referees look up and say, actually, this team's a good team, and they, we get a break. We get a break when we go into a challenge because these are two even teams playing each other. And um, so, yeah, I'm I'm really impressed with the calmness, and it, it starts from, I don't want to pick out people, right, but players like Ramsdale, Shaka, you know, the maturing Gabriel has changed how he approaches football matches. You know, these type people like uh, Kieran Tierney is a bombastic, fiery player that maybe lacks a bit of discipline positionally, that creates situations on our left hand side, which stretches our teams out. We just we're just better structured. We're a bit calmer in possession. We're calmer. We're calmer out of possession. We're a bit. We're just a bit better coached, really. But also, Elliot, I, I don't know about you, mate, but. The things I used to do when I was a young man, I don't do them anymore. I'm a bit more mature, a bit more sensible. You know, a bit more nah, sensible. I still do them all. All yeah, of them. Every yeah, last one of them. Haven't changed all, a bit. We all grow up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> grow up a little bit. And so once you go through experiences, you can, you know, I've been through this before. I now know what to do. I know not what to do. You know, and it's just that. And this is an exciting yeah. thing. This is an exciting thing. Well said. Yeah, it's just, um, I, look, I don't want to see games like this every game. I don't. I don't want to see us play like this every game. But I want to see us be able to play like this. You know, and not... This is the thing, Clive, and, and it's... I, I, I said it on the instant reaction. I really believe it. If you've lived through the last 20 years of Arsenal and you've lived through the Mustafis, you know, that, that era and, you know, goalkeepers who chuck it in their net and defenders who don't know where to hold their line and players who get sent off for emotional reactions or players who won't track back or be organized. I mean, I think back to Mikel's thing about you got to be ready to chase 30 passes, lose the ball and chase 30 passes again. To not be the team that makes a dumb mistake, that shoots yourself in the foot and shoots yourself in the other foot. The, the meme that sums up Arsenal the most over the last 20 years or so is that meme, it's a guy in the hoodie holding a lead pipe about to hit someone with a lead pipe. And the person who he's about to hit is called Arsenal. And the person carrying the lead pipe is called Arsenal. And the lead pipe is called Arsenal, right? <laughs> and it's basically the point that like, Arsenal is the, the team that killed Arsenal for so many years. And we just, we don't do it anymore. And, and, and I get that this isn't an instant classic and I get that you don't want to have to play this way. But to go to the Etihad and be resolute and compact and organized and find your moments to try to win it, but not lose it. Clive, I can't think of too many times we've gone into a game that was a must not lose that we didn't lose. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and and th that is a skill. You have to have that string to your bow. You have to have it. You yeah. shouldn't have to use it a lot, but you have to have it. And I, I, I you know, I, I don't want to get too much into the pundit side of things. I think that's boring podcasting, but I will say that I have seen a lot of clubs praise to the rafters for their ability to shut out the light, close things down, you know, be organized and professional when they need to be. Um, and it's interesting because there's this perception, for example, that Liverpool are this dynamic, exciting, attacking team. They had less XG at the Etihad this season than we did. Liverpool have fewer goals this season than we do. When we played Liverpool at the at the at Anfield, it was a close run game. When they came to the Emirates, we put 3.5 XG on them and beat them 3-1. So I get that the neutrals are annoyed and throwing their toys out of the pram that this didn't entertain them. But the notion that we're not entertainers makes no sense. We've scored the most goals. We have the most goal difference. You know, we did what we had to do. And pragmatism is a thing we've lacked. I'm excited to see us have it, you know? Yeah, I think we've gone through a uh, evolution, haven't we? And I, thought, I want to just go back to my words slightly because those emotional days, we needed them as, mm -hmm. a, as a fan group. We need to connect yeah, to this team. Whether it was incorrect, the right level of emotion, or we got overexcited, it doesn't really matter. We needed that connection. And players like Shaka and Ramsdale gave us that. So I want to make sure I'm absolutely clear on that because we were dead to our team before that. We were dead until this group arrived and we, until we cleaned our dressing room. So that connection, that emotion was very important. But we've evolved into something else because now we need to get serious about winning. 
right? Because people expectations will rise this year and next for certain. Big trophies need to rise for the next eighteen months. They just need to, because the narrative will change, right? So, but we do need to have this face, and it's good to see we have it. The defensive face. So I'll give you a scenario. Just say, for example, we win the home game against Bayern Munich two 0 We go to we go to Germany, and they score to make it two one with half an hour to go. Which face are we going to show? We're going to show the face we showed at Man City, right? We're talking about mm. the Champions League semi final on the line. Which face are we going to show? We're going to show that face, and then we're going to spring out. Hopefully, have quicker wide men and fitter wide men to take the, the counter attack goals that will be on offer. For those people to watch Bayern versus Dortmund at the weekend, I don't want to get too celebratory, but it's going to be their cup final, right? Because the league's gone, but we've got a chance against them because they're not in the best of shape, you know, emotionally and on the pitch wise. But yeah, we need to have this ability, and we have it, and we've had it confirmed by going to the hardest place in the world to play football and come out of there scot-free. Yeah, well said. I think um, it it's one of these games that you know one thing about it too, and I think this was really reflected in how it finished, Clive. You cannot afford to fall behind because you cannot afford to have to chase the game. Yeah. What you can afford to do is try to land the knockout blow at the death. And I think both teams played it that way a little bit. The only time the game got stretched at all was the last 10 minutes or so. Yeah. Doku and Grealish came on for Foden and Kovacic, and City opened themselves up a little more. We had Martinelli's pace and and Trissard, who didn't cover as well defensively, let's be honest, yep, as Jesus didn't. did. But he, di- he didn't. He just didn't. But he did get away a, a few times. I'll tell you, there was this chance. Martinelli had a shot blocked um, from a good, a good move. And... It, it winds up with Rice, who tries a cutback that goes out for a corner. Yeah. I am going to tell you, watch that back. If Rice is able to get that cutback lifted a tiny bit or six inches the other side, that's the goal that wins the game right there. Um, and and it's that happened just before the Leo counter yeah. where um where he took the shot instead of sliding it to Martinelli. But but then the end have, state of this game... Then we have Haaland, yeah. though, crossing it back to Diaz on the six-yard line, and Haaland yeah. kicks around yeah. the ball, and that's their moment that they have. Yep. It's a very tight, even game with two people with the same style. And but we tried to land a- the knockout blow, both of us. It t- The last 10 minutes or so, the game came to life a little, and I think it's because both of these teams knew if you expose yourself early and get behind, you're in bad shape you do not want to fall behind yeah, but yeah. you know i think they went for it at the end and i you know i can respect that i think um i'll level with you i couldn't watch extra time i i was i wasn't watching it i was just like scrolling twitter <laughs> i couldn't watch it i was so nervous i can't imagine the intensity of that environment so as we wrap up here just quickly on the point being a good point i think it's a tremendous point there are people that think we had to win this game we know that there are people that think that yep. I think the odds will show that we are now third favorite for the title, but like right there, you know, where it's like 35, 33, 20, it's, it's close. I think, you know, I think wherever you look, the odds would have it pretty close. And I think a lot of that is based purely on the fact that first of all, Liverpool do have a two point lead now, and we probably just about have the toughest fixtures. But the thing that's weird about saying the toughest fixtures is this is a weird league right now. I don't think there are too many very good teams, you know, so there are two good teams and we've taken four points off them. What's your opinion? N- not of whether we played the right way or the wrong way or any of that. We've covered all that. Your opinion on the point as a good point and where it leaves us. Yeah, it is a, it's a good point. Where it leaves us, it leaves us with things out of our control. Because Liverpool are perfect. They win the league, right? But um, but I don't think they're going to be. I'm not sure we're going to be neither. So, um, you know, when you sort of rock up to Fulham away over Christmas and you think, well, we should be okay. We go one and up. We're definitely going to be okay. And then we deservedly lose out of nowhere. That can just happen in football. You know, I think uh, watching Sheffield United this week, I think they drew three all at the weekend, I think, Sheffield United. I mean, when we mm-hmm. played them, <laughs> you thought they might as well just pack out their bags and go. You, just, you can never tell what you're walking into. And I think it's just important. Where I give us a bit of a chance is, Defensively, we can stay. We look stable, so I think we can, we can control events. Strange enough, Elliot, if you ask me the truth, I think Liverpool are the third best team in the league. You know, and but they're sitting top and and they're favourites. So sometimes it's 
It's just about getting the result. Can they continue to keep doing this while giving up so many shots without so many key people not being there? Sometimes when key players come back, you know what happens to your mindset? You think, well, he's back now, and you just drop off a little bit because your good players are back. And suddenly that's where you can go wrong. I think it's just, we just got to wait and see. But the most important thing for me, and the reason why I was happy with the point is, I want Arsenal to be in the room in the last three weeks of the season, knowing it's still all there. That's the key for me. And then we see how other people cope with pressure. If you don't put people under pressure, you don't know how resilient they are. We maybe beat ourselves a bit last year with the pressure and, and City looming around us and we found excuses around defensive instability and injuries at the wrong time. But when it comes down to it, we weren't ready. Simple as that, we weren't ready. This year, we're more ready. And next year, we'll be more ready again. That's the truth of it. That's how I, where my mind is. I'm not throwing away mm. this year. Your point about Champions League earlier on is a really valid one. And the buying game, oh, dearie me, that's going to be hot. Going to be hot. That's a hot ticket to try and get. And then we'll see what happens after that. But, yeah, we're on the right path still, mate. We're still on the right path. Yeah, I just looked at the odds quickly. I mean, we're at roughly 28%. You know, Liverpool roughly forty two percent, City right in the right in between, and that feels about right to me. But like, those are close enough that anything can still happen. You know what yeah. I mean? That's not like ninety five percent, and all of a sudden something crazy has to happen, which is I think where it would have been roughly had we lost this game. Um, you know, and I think you saw it in Liverpool's game against Brighton, by the way. You know, when when we faced Brighton at home, we had 26 shots, nine on target. They had one shot on target, six shots in the whole game. Um, Liverpool couldn't really close the black do- back door against Brighton. Say yeah. that three times fast. The back door against Brighton. Um, <laughs> and yeah, I realize that this is becoming a tedious criticism of them because they are top of the league and they keep winning. But I do think that their games are going to be more chaotic. And I think it opens up more possibilities. So... I still think anything can happen, obviously. The other thing I'll say about Arsenal, we keep saying Arsenal have been the best team this season. Maybe we have. The underlying metrics say we have. But I think we've kind of been two teams, frankly. I don't think we were great to start the season. Remember all those podcasts, has the attack clicked, has the attack clicked, has the attack clicked. Remember the 11 Premier League games we started with Eddie and Kedia at striker? That's, by the way, that's not knocking Eddie and Kedia. It's like, he's not even getting on the pitch now. You know, um, the games that we started you know, with all kinds of players that that really just aren't in the picture anymore or, or a way of playing that isn't how we play anymore. I think we are a very different team now than we were then. And you, you said yeah. it, Clive, at the beginning of the season. We may not be starting fast, but we want to finish fast. We're kind of doing the city thing. Exactly. Right now, in April, we look the best team in the league. Unlike last season, where we were the best team in the league in October. And one of the most mediocre teams in the league in April. And a lot of that's due to injuries. I acknowledge it. We'll we'll have a lot on the Champions League to come. I don't want to get into it now. I do think, as I said, that this is a game that will put us in good position psychologically for that test. And by the way, if we make the semifinal, this could be the opponent. One nil at home, nil nil away. That puts you in a Champions League final. So, uh, you know, I realize it's different and that's extrapolating a lot. Just as a final thought, do you care at all about the narrative around we didn't entertain people and you know it wasn't fun I enough? I mean, it just I haven't even so, seen it. So, I haven't even seen it. Okay, and I don't care. Let's not do it. Then let's not do it. Let, let's do. Let's do this as a final thing. Games every three days. We know it's going to be a nightmare. I think we've been handed a very, very big advantage, though. A big, big advantage in this match week. We've just had our hardest game. Okay of the season, the hardest game you will play in the Premier League, City away. And our midweek game is, let's call it the second most manageable, I don't want to call it easy, but second most manageable game you'll play in a season, Luton at home. Whatever you think of Luton, they've been plucky, they've been fun, credit to them. They have not been good on their travels, especially defensively. They've not shown the organizational capability. And even if you want to point to the away game, you're like, what about the away game? We scored four goals away. (laughs) We scored four. Okay, I know we conceded three, silly. We're not going to concede three at home. If we could score four on them away, what do you think we can do to them at home? So I, I, I like this game because we're coming off a very difficult fixture. Liverpool, similarly, have Sheffield United at home. City have Villa coming to them. Now, I, I think they will destroy Villa, personally. But it's a little trickier. But what do you think of that fact? Because had this been a tough midweek fixture, an away game that, you know, Wolves away if it was this week, I'd be really worried about our fatigue, our concentration, our focus. 
this feels like a bit of a gift given what we're coming off of and now what we have midweek. Yeah, so as fans, we always find something to worry about. And you more than most, Elliot, but you always find something to worry about. Mm-hmm. And for me, I'm walking away and I'm looking at Sacco Martinelli and I'm just hoping they're in a hell farm today. Do you know? That's what I'm hoping. Because if them two get right, all these fixtures look manageable. You know, and I think it's, the positive is that Jesus is showing a bit of fitness again. That's really positive. Another positive, whether you like it or not, is that Party and Tom Yasu are showing more fitness than they showed previously for the minutes they're on. We need to build them out because we're going to need them. You know, and and so the worry I have is our reliance on Sacco and Martinelli. That's the worry I have walking away. Now, if they get a bit more rest, get a bit more rhythm, and they have a chance to attack a Luton team and build some confidence, because Martinelli's confidence really started from two very late goals against Crystal Palace. And then he went for a rich vein of form, you know? And so let's get impact scoring because that kid's got something. He doesn't really care about pressure and the environment and the running. He's got something that mentally really, really strong. If we can get him scoring and running and fit again and manage him, every team he's going to create a problem for them. And he allows the room for Saka and Odegaard and Havertz to do their thing. So... I think he's a very important player for us for stretching teams and creating space. So on, on Tuesday now, we had a good conversation for an hour or so about our defensive structure and stability and all our defenders doing really, really well. Maturity, physicality, adaptation to the sh- changing shape of Man City and the substitutes, etc. Very good podcasting stuff around that boring side of the game, off the ball. I hope we talk about on-the-ball brilliance on, on Thursday, Elliot, because... There's, if we show that side of us again I and mean, it's still there and we're healthy, then I think we'll all be encouraged for for Brighton away as well at the weekend. Yeah. And I mean, this is how dumb the narrative is around football and how, how in the moment it is, Clive. I think all three title contenders will hold serve in midweek. I think they'll all get three points. But Clive, Sunday of the weekend, Liverpool, Liverpool could find themselves going to Old Trafford a point behind Arsenal. Yeah. And and all of a sudden, the picture looks very different until they beat United 10-0, which is frankly what I expect. Who knows what will happen? Uh, right? I think we, United off the ball, not quite as good as us, mate. That's all I'm, I'm going to say. It's nuts, dude. I, I was watching them in, in that game. I mean, they didn't deserve a point, but we won't talk about it now. Maybe we'll do a Schadenfreude pod, but saying like, but they had their Watford Emery game Even this past weekend. It's even worse than 30 that. shots taken. I mean, all you had to do to bypass their midfield was make one pass and start running straight up the midfield. It was it was Incredible. bananas. Okay, um, we don't need to talk about United, but they are funny. And if you didn't watch that game, watch it. It's very fun. They got battered. Um, I almost wish they had they had won it because Ten Hag in forever. But, you know, Southgate will fix it, I'm sure. Okay, uh, we'll leave it there. We are in a really, really good position, I think, now. And it's just about... Holding serve. Wednesday we play Luton. Remember, we will have an instant reaction after every single game. Live instant reactions. So you can see it right at full time. Video and audio. And then the audio comes out as soon as that's done recording. So the main pod will stay a Monday to Thursday. If you need a pod to listen to, you can check out the Football Vision pod that Phil does. I think he's just killing it. Um, But yeah, that's basically what we got. And as a last reminder, please, if you have the wherewithal, if you have the ability please give to the fundraiser, justgiving.com forward slash page forward slash AVP. Um, There are children who love this club and love North London who have never been a part of the wider world who who need the support. And uh, I'm just thrilled we get the chance to do it. And remember, you have a chance to win a VIP box ticket to the Bournemouth game, second to last home game of the season. That's going to be a hard ticket to get, let me tell you. So uh, you can do it in style. We'll leave it there. We'll have uh, a lot more throughout the week. Clive's on Twitter at Clive PFC. Thanks, Clive. Thank you very much. My name's Elliot Smith. You can block me on Twitter. Ain't gonna love you. And we'll talk to you after Arsenal 10, Luton Nil. No.